I invite you to turn your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and like a lot of the weeks in this series, we'll be moving to a variety of passages in the Bible. Some I'll just quote briefly, some we'll spend uh, a little more time in, but we'll start always in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit there, and hopefully you have a message outline also. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness and self-control. And that's where we've been going through each one of the fruit, the foundational fruit of love, and then developing all the other ones as they're mentioned here, and then we look at them throughout Scripture. But remember, they're gifts, and then we're called to steward those gifts, and they're given in close relationship with Jesus. And so last time, that goodness one, you know, instead of this perform performance-oriented approach to God, we're called to this Jesus-oriented approach to goodness. And remember those discernment tips on goodness? Well, what does goodness look like? Loving deeply, studying and applying God's Word, finding godly examples, and of course receiving goodness as a gift. And that rightness with God is a gift from the Lord when we're declared right through faith. And then we're called to do good. And I hope you've had um, opportunity to maybe be a do-gooder, not this week, not in a a negative sense, but in the sense that the Bible describes. This week, God's faithfulness, and this one is a little harsher on us, I think, as we look, especially as we look in Hosea a little bit later. But when we think about faithfulness, of course we think about God's faithfulness and God's, and, and kind of a technical definition, God's determined loyalty to a gracious covenant. And certainly that that defines who God is. He's faithful, and so he has this determined loyalty to his gracious covenants. And we often think of, for example, God's steadfast love. But then our faithfulness, that's where it gets a little more challenging because God is faithful, and we tend to be not so faithful. And that's nothing new, by the way, not just for today. It's certainly we're going to see in ancient history as well. So faithfulness then becomes our response of trust in and loyalty to God. So God's faithfulness, and we're going to look at God's faithfulness first, just like we've done every time in each of the fruit, and then God's faithfulness. But our faithfulness then is a response of loyalty and trust in God. And that's where it gets sometimes a little more challenging. So highlight God's ongoing faithfulness on your outlines there. We're going to look first at God, a couple quick passages, but you might turn to Hosea in the Old Testament in advance here. And then we're called to recognize God's loyalty amidst disloyalty. And so God is very loyal, and then that disloyalty, it tends to be, you know, unfortunately, it tends to be us, God's people. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God, who called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in this introduction, you know, Paul says, is faithful. So at the core of his being, God is faithful. He's loyal. We can rely on him. Even over in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, one of the reasons it talks about there that Jesus became in human form, we, and be, you know, Jesus is 100% God and also 100% human, 100% man, that he might become, in verse 17 of chapter 2 in Hebrews, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And of course it goes on that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. And so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God is loyal, God is faithful, and we want to recognize that and highlight that. And to do that in contrast, now hopefully maybe you're already in Hosea, and if you look in the Old Testament, think Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. He's one of the prophets. And it was during the time of the divided kingdom, about eight, you know, 2,800 years ago. And you think of Israel and Judah. And Hosea was a prophet of Israel in the 8th century B.C. And, you know, poor Hosea, in the history of unusual prophet requests, he has a doozy. And God uses Hosea's marriage as an illustration of God's loyalty and faithfulness. In fact, the New Testament, we see that husband and wife relations are an example of the 
body of Christ in our response to God and so forth. But here, poor Hosea, his marriage is an example of people's disloyalty and unfaithfulness and God's loyalty. And for those of you, for example, that might have suffered over the years in relationship, have suffered the sting of unfaithfulness in relationship, this poor living illustration is powerful and it's kind of disturbing. So in Hosea at chapter 1, and hopefully you're there, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. So we got this introductory, and then verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman. It's like, oh, that's challenging. And have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So then he went out, and we see here that he married Gomer, and they began having children. Okay, so that's a, that's a tough request. And sometimes God gives tough requests to his people and really to prophets here. And this un marital unfaithfulness, God is going to use as a living example. And I think also to help Hosea understand and be able to write and, and proclaim the word of the Lord very dramatically and emotionally and powerfully. God uses this, this very challenging marital situation as an illustration of our unfaithfulness. So as, and in this case, it's a, you say, well, man, it's a hard rap for this lady, Gomer, is it? Are ladies always the ones that are unfaithful in the Bible? No, that's not how it works. But in this case, we see Hosea is the example where God is faithful and Gomer is unfaithful. And so we see this spelled out and it's really a living illustration and sometimes God allows allows those kind of things. And here we see it spelled out explicitly where God says you're going to be in a relationship that's an adulterous relationship and it's going to be a living illustration that God is faithful and his people tend not to be. And so we recognize God's loyalty amidst disloyalty. And as you scan, and maybe you're doing that already, as you're scanning through chapters 1 and 2 there, we see it's hard times. They have children and they give given special names that signify the fact that, uh, and, and we see that it's not just about Jose, Hosea's relationship with his wife, but it's an illustration of our disloyalty, God's people's disloyalty. And there's some punishment things starting in chapter 2. And we follow this story and it's kind of disturbing and it's, um, it's like, we, we think about, wow, I, adultery is one of those things that's so horrible in our minds, and yet then we, we, we often don't think about spiritual adultery in relationship with the Lord. It's just too vivid of an image, but that's the image that's used here. God's loyal, God's faithful, we tend to be unfaithful. And so you see this whole story spelled out in chapters 1 and 2, and so by the time you get to verse 19 of chapter 2, we're looking for some hope. And this highlights God's faithfulness in the midst of our unfaithfulness. And God says this, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. So it's, he's, we're looking ahead, even in future to us, until when Christ returns at the second coming. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth, and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those people, not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. And see, God says, I will be faithful no matter what, even in the midst of his people's unfaithfulness. And he is our God, and he is so kindly and lovingly faithful. So we're called to highlight then God's ongoing faithfulness. Recognize that God is loyal amidst our at times, right? Disloyalty. And so then we're called to praise God's, and another way of saying loyalty and faithfulness is God is dependable. We can praise God's 
dependability. We can rely on God, right? He's dependable. He's re- That's not a phrase we often use about God, but that makes sense. If we're faithful and we're loyal, we're dependable. You ever asked a, 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 a not dependable person to do something and you're wondering, well, I wonder if it's actually going to happen, right? That happens a lot in husband-wife relationships. And, and so, here in Psalm 89, we see this highlighted God's faithfulness. God, we can completely depend upon. So the psalmist writes in Psalm 89, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Verse 2, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Now in verse 5, the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness, too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can compare with the Lord? And then all the way down in verse 8. Who, O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. So God's loyalty, his dependability, is to be admired and to praise. And so we're called to just praise God. Thank you so much for your ongoing faithfulness. So we recognize God's loyal. We praise his dependability. And then what happens is, since God is so faithful, we can trust him completely. On your outlines there, we can trust God completely, even with eternity, even with the issue of forgiveness of sins. And so that verse over in the New Testament, 1 John 1, 9, it's beautiful. Many, many of us know it. If we confess our sins, he is what? faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And see, we need that forgiveness. We need that purification. And God says, you know what? I'm faithful. I can take care of that. And when we confess, he is faithful and just and he forgives. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and the Apostle Paul is writing in this chapter about... um, trying to make a visit, and sometimes you know, he writes about hoping to do this and the uncertainty of plans, and we don't know what the future is, and he's hoping to go to these spots, and, he, and he's making plans, and he's talking about those. But So he uses that as an example of where our plans, our future are uncertain, with, you know, in day-to-day things. But God, on the other hand, is completely faithful. So he says in 2 Corinthians 1.18, But as surely as God is faithful... Our message to you is not yet yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. And I love that. We might be uncertain about uh, day-to-day details of where we're going, what we're doing, what's going to happen. But with Jesus, it's always yes. Jesus knows what he's doing. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Isn't that nice? You know, Jesus is yes. He says, oh, I can do this. I'm loyal. I'm reliable. I know what I'm doing. You can trust in me completely. We might not understand everything that's going on and all the details, but trust in me. And with God, faithfulness is tied to his loyal love. And with us then, faithfulness is seen as the fruitful and expected response then to the faithfulness of God, our duty of obedience. So God, his faithfulness is tied to his loyal love. And, but this next section for us is our fruitful, that means active and, and causing impact, and expected response uh, of God's, to uh, our faithfulness back to God. And it's really a duty of obedience. So we highlight God's ongoing faithfulness and we recognize God's loyalty and we tend to be disloyal and we praise God's dependability we trust God completely so we got to ask right and we do this every time through this series do I thank God for his loyalty to his gracious promises have I have I provided opportunity in my life in my life to say God thank you so much that you were so loyal that you were so reliable that you were so faithful to your gracious promises and the promise Promises you you make to us are full of grace and mercy. Well, now it gets a little harder, right? And that Hosea part was a little disturbing. But now we're called then to embrace God's transformative faithfulness. As he has shown us faithfulness, then we're called in relationship with him. One of the fruit of the Spirit then 
is faithfulness. And where that starts, and we see it over and over again, is we receive salvation as a gift through what? Faith. And sometimes we divorce the word faithfulness and faith and kind of separate them out, but they're really they're tied together. I mean, the same concept. And we receive salvation as a gift through a response of faith. And then we respond in faith at a point in time, but that faith then continues. So when we've looked at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we've looked at it a couple different times over the course of this series. It's for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, not just the salvation, but the faith itself, it's a gift of God and not by works so that no one can boast. So we're saved by grace, that's a gift. That response of faith then is also a gift. You say, well, that's kind of hard to understand. And you're right, it is. But faith itself and then a life of faithfulness is a gift from the Lord. So we receive salvation as a gift through faith. And then we express that faithfulness through life stewardship. That's what I put on your outlines, through stewardship. And a very famous a parable Jesus tells us in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, it starts in verse 14. But remember those money, you know, different servants are given a certain uh, amount of money. And then the master goes and then the servants do something with that money. And the one who had received five talents, he went at once and put his money to work and he gained five more. And the one with two talents gained two more. But the one who re sent, got, uh, received one talent, he um, went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. So then the master returns, right? He says, okay, I want to see how faithful you've been with what I've given you. And so in verse 20, the man who had received the five, ta five talents, he brought the other five. Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and, what's the word, faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the one that got two, same thing. Look, hey, Lord, I have two more. And, and the master replies, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And boy, this sounds wonderful. So we're to express faithfulness in our life. We respond in faith. And then we express that faithfulness through stewardship. Well, that one, that got one talent, he went and hid it. And this part's not so nice, right? Some of these parables are kind of harsh. And you wicked servant, you know, you, you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. And, and then it gets um, kind of harsh for that last servant that wasn't faithful. And see, folks, we're called to a life of faithfulness, not just a one-point time response of faith, but then express that faith, that loyalty, loyalty back to God through a life of obedience and stewardship. So we receive salvation as a gift through faith, then we express that faithfulness through stewardship. But this trans this faithfulness is meant to be transformative, not just at a point in time, but throughout our life. Finally, if you go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, this is often called the, the Hall of Faith or the Hall of Fame chapter in the Bible. And frankly, we're called to choose a faithful life. When we put this all together, then we're called to choose a faithful life. We respond in faith to the gospel, that's by faith. And then we get close to Jesus and, and we study God's word and we pray and, it, and we connect with God's people and we grow in that faith. And then God gifts us with this fruit of the spirit and then we're called to steward that. And, and so it leads to a faithful life, a life that is loyal back to God uh, according to his promises and, and what he asks us to do and how we serve him in all the unique areas of our life. And we see that spelled out throughout history so in Hebrews 11, the writer says, okay, here's some examples of a life of faith in good times and in bad times. So faith, in verse 1 there, is uh, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, a real famous definition there. And this is what the ancients were commended for. And so by faith, 
we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was condemned, con con commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. And it goes on and describes that in verse 6. And without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So verse 7, by faith, Noah, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, verse 11, by faith, uh, by faith, Abraham once again. And then in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. See, it's this ongoing uh, process. Respond in faith to the gospel and then live a life that is faithful. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And it talks once again about Abraham, talks about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and goes on and on. And then in verse 32, what more shall I say? You know, it's like he's run out of things to write. I, he says, I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions and quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword and whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and, and raised foreign armies and, and women received back their dead raised to life again and they say well that that sounds all wonderful man i'd have faith that those things happen to me but the story goes on doesn't it others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison and they were stoned they were sought in two they were put to death by the sword they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Especially talking about this was all pre-Jesus, right? God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Quite the examples. See, we're called to embrace God's transformative faithfulness. We respond in faith, and then we steward that faith, and then we live out a faithful life. So do I thank God for his loyalty to his gracious promises? And do I thank God through trust and loyalty to him then? Not just in him, trust in him, but do I thank God through trust and loyalty given back toward him? him. See, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table here in the next few moments. And as we do that, we're reminded of God's faithfulness to us. And we're reminded that we need a response of faith. And, and we're thankful for the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. But as we partake together today, I really encourage you and I remind you to celebrate what Christ has done. And then also spend some time in prayer and say, God, thank you so much for your faithfulness. And help us to receive that gift of salvation that when we're very thankful. But then help us to show that thankfulness through a response of faith that carries out throughout time. We choose a path, a life of faithfulness and loyalty and trust in God in return. And that is a progressive process. We're reminded of that when we partake together. So on the night Jesus died, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So let's partake and remember. He also took the cup. <clears throat> 
cup of redemption. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for your loving loyalty. You are so gracious in your promises. We thank you for your loyalty, your reliability, your dependability. Thank you that you promise and you promise in gracious and kind ways. And then God, help us to thank you also through trust in and loyalty back to you to a life that is a good stewardship of the opportunity and time and situation and all the things that you give us. May we reflect our thanks by being loyal back to you. And we understand that that loyalty is hard for us and faithfulness is hard for us. And, and sometimes we are like a, an adulterous spouse. It's hard to even say that, Lord, yet that's us. So God, call us to a life of faith, response of faith, and then in relationship with you, a life that reflects our loyalty and our trust in you. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.